Hello, I'm Dr. Yvette Rubido, and I'm the Vice President for Research and Director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome to our webinar. Today, we will focus on a guide to 2020 census data privacy. Here's an overview of today's agenda. I just provided the welcome. Our speakers today are David Van Riper and Randall Lakey, who I will introduce shortly. Once the speakers are done with the presentation, we'll reserve time for questions at the end. Next slide. Before we get started, I'm gonna let you know how you can participate in today's web event. So this is a depiction of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, and it is made up of two parts, the viewer window on the left, which displays the presentations and the control panel on the right. I'll quickly navigate how to use the control panel so you can readily participate in today's web event. Next slide. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel. And then here's where you will find all of the information about your audio connection. Um, we recommend dialing in via phone rather than the computer as it tends to limit feedback. To dial in, you will find the number and the access code here, along with your unique audio pin. As you can see, all attendees are currently muted in listen-only mode. And at the end of the presentation, we will open for questions and answers and our Q&A. And at this time, please submit your questions via writing them in the questions pane. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded. After the event, you'll receive an email with a link to a short evaluation, and the recording will be available soon on our NCAI YouTube page and our website in a couple of days. Next slide. Okay, first I will make a few short comments to catch everybody up on the topic for today. <clears throat> so this webinar is focused on the 2020 census which is conducted once every 10 years with the goal of a complete count of everyone in the United States. This is not about the American Community Survey or ACS, which is a yearly sample of the population. If you've taken the 2020 census already, you know it's short and it has a few questions on demographics and housing data. Next slide. The 2020 census is critical for American Indians and Alaska Natives since it's used for redistricting and representation, federal funding formulas and decisions, local, local tribal governance, and American Indian Alaska Native research and surveillance. So a complete count is really critical. Next slide. I hope all of you have completed the 2020 census form online, by phone, or the paper version. If not, the deadline is now September 30th. And if you want to get help to get out the count in your community, Email census at ncai.org or go to our Indian Country Counts website. NCAI has resources to help your community. Next slide. So today's presentation is focused on the U.S. Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance system, which is how they plan to protect the privacy of individual data. However, these new privacy methods they are using for the 2020 census may create problems for the accuracy of American Indian Alaska Native data. So today's webinar is an update on the potential impact and a prep for any upcoming tribal consultations on this issue. Next slide. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is David Van Riper, who is the Director of Spatial Analysis at IPUMS and Co-Principal Investigator for the National Historic Geographic Information System. He also leads the iPhone team researching the impact of differential privacy on decennial census data. Then the second speaker is Randall Lakey. He's an associate professor of public policy at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And for the audience, again, make sure to write down your questions for our Q&A session after the speakers are finished in the questions pane. All right, let's get started. Welcome, David and Randy. Thank you very much, uh, Yvette, for that well, wonderful introduction. 
Uh, my name is David Van Riper. As uh, Yvette said, I'm the Director of Spatial Analysis at, at IPMS, which is at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to provide a little bit of background on differential privacy for the 2020 census and a, a small bit of analysis. And then Randy is going to provide more detail on analysis related to the American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Protecting the privacy of census respondents while publishing quality data are dual mandates for the U.S. Census Bureau. In August of 2018, the Bureau announced, announced a major change in their approach to privacy protection. According to the Bureau, increases in computing power and access to large individual level databases mean that their traditional disclosure avoidance techniques no longer provide strong enough attention. In response, the Bureau is adopting a framework termed differential privacy for its 2020 disclosure avoidance system which will entail injecting random noise into nearly all published data in order to guarantee a minimal risk of privacy loss. But as you'll see today, that privacy protection comes at a cost. The published data will be less accurate. Next slide. I, I go back one slide, please, actually. In two blog posts in August and September of 2018, the Census Bureau's chief scientist described limitations to the Bureau's current privacy protection techniques, including a lack of transparency about how frequently they were used, and discussed plans to improve privacy protection using methods based on differential privacy. One benefit would be increased transparency because the Census Bureau can publish details about the parameters used in their system. So we're going on about two years since the first announcement was made relating to this change. Next. In February of 2019, the Deputy Director of the Census Bureau, Ron Jarman, made the official announcement that the Census Bureau would be adopting uh, differential privacy for its disclosure avoidance techniques. Next slide. In June of 2019, the Census Bureau finally released source computer code and sample data uh, based on the 1940 complete count census data. Uh, this, these data, were, we were then able to analyze these sample data sets and determine how well this new disclosure avoidance algorithm worked and how tweaking the algorithm's parameters would impact the accuracy of the output data. Unfortunately, the algorithm only produced differentially private data for a handful of variables and for a handful of geographic levels, including the United States, states, counties, and enumeration districts. Thus, we had a hard time assessing how the algorithm would affect the data like we collect now. Next slide. It wasn't until October of 2019, less than one year ago, that we finally saw differentially private data that were based on the 2010 decennial census. This release contained dozens of tables that mirror the planned 2020 data releases, and it included all types of geographies, including American Indian tribal areas, Alaska Native villages, and Native Hawaiian homelands. We could then take these demonstration data and compare it to the original 2010 uh, census data to get a more realistic assessment of this new algorithm's impact on the data utility and accuracy. And you'll see some of those results later in my talk and in Randy's presentation. Next slide. Uh, following up on the October 2019 data release, the Census Bureau uh, really at the at the urging of, of data users and scientists and policymakers, released a second version of the differentially private data um, a, a month ago. This new version was based on a redesigned algorithm that could address deficiencies identified in the 2019 data. Next slide. When the Bureau released the second version in July, they told users to expect additional data releases throughout the rest of 2020. As of today, we have not heard of any forthcoming releases, and given changes in the Census Bureau's operational plan, I currently don't expect another release until October at the earliest, although we may get something in, in September. Next slide, please. So that's how we, we got here today. That's why we're, we're sitting here about two years after the Bureau first announced this and, and I and others have spent the last two years working hard to get up to speed on what this change means for the accuracy and utility of, of the data. And you'll see a, a little bit of that 
uh, in a few minutes. Um, but before I talk about the analysis, I just want to quickly go over how differential privacy is implemented, just to provide you with some background on how it works and what types of policy decisions play a key role in the output in the output data that get presented. So I'm going to use a, a small example to explain the basic implementation of differential privacy. Uh, next slide. So let's suppose that I've done a, a small survey and I've asked uh, 100 respondents two questions. I've asked them to indicate their sex, whether or not they're male or female, and I asked them to indicate their school attendance uh, history. So whether if they, if they never attended school, if they're currently attending school, or if they attended school in the past. So I have 100 responses to my survey, and this is what I call the true microdata. Next slide. I convert that true data, the true survey responses into a cross tabulation, where I cross tabulate the two sex responses, male or female, by the three school attendance variables, never attending, attending, or attended in the past. Here you can see I have three males who never attended school, four females who never attended school. I have 33 males who attended school in the past and 31 females who attended school in the past. So this is the true data that I'm starting from. And I have an overall population of 100. Next slide, please. What we then do is we construct a curve and we then take random variables, random values from that curve, one random value for each cell in the cross tabulation. So in the prior slide, I had a six cell cross tabulation. So I'm gonna take six random values from this, from this curve and I'm going to add those counts to the, to the cross tabulation. And the key thing to look at on this slide, uh, go back one slide, please is the bottom line on this figure represents the error or the noise that will get added to the count. So you can see that in the middle of the, of the um, x-axis, there's a zero. And then we have some positive values to the right and some negative values to the left. The thin dark line represents the probability of drawing a particular value. As the error values increase or decrease, there's a smaller probability of drawing a value. So if you look at the, at the positive 20 along the right side of the curve, you'll see that that thin dark line is very close to the x-axis. That means we have a small chance of drawing that value of 20, but there is still a chance that it could happen. The shape of that thin dark line is determined by parameters set by the data analyst or by a committee. I want to fundamentally emphasize that it is not set by a computer. It's set by a set of people. To make data more private, the curve is made wider, and the probability of choosing a larger error value increases. To make data more accurate, the curve is made narrower, and you have a higher probability of choosing an uh, error value of 0 or 1 or 2. Next slide, please. We take those six random draws and we add those values to the true data. So here, for the males never attended school, we've uh, added a negative one. So we've re re reduced the true count from three to two. For the males who are currently attending school, uh, we drew a value of zero from their error distribution so that it stays exactly the same at 12. But notice the female never attended uh, uh, cell. The true value was four. And, but our random draw was a positive eight. So we have tripled the number of females who were attending school from the survey. So now instead of there being four females who have never attended school, there are 12 females who have never attended school. Well, if I was a, a, a school system who was planning to decide how many students might be coming into my, into my class in the future, and I'm expecting 12 and I only get four, I may have allocated, misallocated resources towards under the assumption that I was going to get more uh, students coming into my class than, than I actually did. The other key thing to note here is that the overall population in the survey has increased from 100 to 108. So the key thing here is that we've made these data uh, more private by adding the values to these true counts. But in making it private, we've also reduced the accuracy. And in some cases, by, by a large margin, we've reduced the accuracy in the, in the counts. Next slide, please. 
There are many implicit policy decisions embedded within this toy example. What I want to uh, turn to next are the um, major policy decisions that the census is going to have to make in the near future. Next slide. These are the three most important policy decisions that I think the census will make related to differential privacy. One, what's the global privacy loss budget for all 2020 census data? How is that privacy loss budget allocated to specific geographic levels? And how is that privacy loss budget allocated to demographic variables? Next slide, please. For the 2010 demonstration data, the Census Bureau explicitly allocated privacy loss budget to the geographic units in the red boxes. You'll notice that the American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian areas received no allocation of the privacy loss budget. This has a major impact on the accuracy and quality of the data for those areas. Next slide, please. For both data products that we'll talk about today, the October 2019 and July 2020 data releases, the Census Bureau used the same allocation to geographic level. So there's no difference uh, in that allocation. Next slide, please. When we talk about allocation to demographic variables in the October data set, the Census Bureau privileged the voting age by race, by Hispanic ethnicity variables, and the sex by age variables. Next slide, please. In the July 2020 release, the Census Bureau privileged the total population counts for geographic areas, voting age by race, by Hispanic ethnicity, and age by sex, by race, by Hispanic ethnicity. So they changed the which variables they wanted to make more accurate in the, in the July 2020 from the October 2019. Next slide, please. So now I wanna show you two slides that just get at the, the, the differences that the, the, how they make these decisions and how these decisions matter related to the accuracy of the data. So I'm gonna walk you through this plot because it, it shows the, what happens when, when, when they change their policy, how the, how the data change. So this plot is for the 324 federally recognized tribal areas in the US. I took the total population counts for each tribal area from the October and July data sets, and I subtracted the 2010 summary file one, what I call the true total population count for each tribal area. And I then just plot that raw difference. To make the plot more interpretable, I divided the tribal areas into population quintiles. Uh, tribal areas with the largest population are in quintile five on the right-hand side. Areas with the smallest populations are in quintile one to the left-hand side. And so the red are the October 2019 results and the July, uh, the blue are the July 2020 results. Uh, a few things to take away here. You can see the emphasis on the total population uh, you see that the that the, the the box plots in blue are narrower, right? The 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 plot the, the those boxes are just a little bit narrower and a little bit more symmetrical around zero, where there's no difference. That shows that by by privileging total population counts, the bureau has improved the accuracy of the total population count for each uh, for each tribal area. Although you still see some some outliers. Uh, in the uh, blue, uh, in quintile five in the blue, those uh, two dots near a negative 500 are for uh, the Navajo Nation Reservation and the Mississippi Choctaw Reservation. And, and that error bar for the Mississippi Choctaw Reservation represents an almost 8% error rate. Um, the Navajo Nation is the largest uh, Indian area in, in the US. And so that difference is a very small uh, proportional difference. The other thing I want you to notice is in the red, the red box plots, you'll notice that as we move from quintile one to quintile two to quintile three, you'll notice that a, a large chunk of the, the differences are all below zero. So in all of these cases, the differentially private count was smaller than the summary file one counts. So the Census Bureau was biasing the total population counts for American Indian areas down. So if a if an Ameri if a, if the 2010 summary file one was saying that um, on average the uh, population was 500 people, the Census Bureau was saying that that was maybe 450 people. It was it was undercounting that, which could have major implications for funding uh, funding and other uh, tribal related um, uh, policies. 
uh, you'll see that the, the switch to the total population emphasis and other tweaks to the algorithm has reduced that bias. Now in, in those blue bars, uh, they don't tend to be as noticeably negative uh, undercounting of, of tribal areas. Next slide, please. If we convert those differences into percent differences, uh, now you can see each of these uh, uh, dots and, and the box plots represent the percent difference between the differentially private data and the uh, SF1 from 2010. Here you can see for quintile one, these are the smallest tribal areas. You can see that the, uh, the percent differences are quite large. This makes sense because the overall pop counts in these areas tend to be pretty small between actually between zero for some rancherias in California, uh, up to around 100 or 200 individuals. Well, if those are off by you know, 50 people, that's gonna be a 50% 50 50 error. For quintile five, you see that those percent differences are, are, are really uh, fairly narrow around, around the, the, uh, the zero mark. Uh, and you can see the bias again here, where for quintiles two, three, and four in red, you'll notice that uh, a large chunk of the values are all, all below zero. Next slide, please. So I hope in this, in this quick talk, uh, I, I wanna conclude with a few, a few different items. One, the differentially privacy trades off privacy for accuracy. If you wanna make things more private, you're gonna have to make the data less accurate. Two, policy decisions matter a, a ton the impact and the utility and accuracy of the data. You'll notice that the Bureau tweaked its, its allocation to focus on total population and they improved those, those counts. But I, I bet in Randy's talk, you're gonna see that that had implications for race specific counts, for the American Indian and Alaska native counts on, on tribal areas. And three, the one takeaway I also wanna say is that higher response rates will help mitigate the impact of differential privacy. So if, if the, the uh, residents on tribal areas are responding to the census and getting that, that count up. That means that the overall count for those areas will get higher, which means that the noise injection into those counts will, will be minimal on, on a percentage basis. And so anything we can do to, to push up those response rates is gonna be important. Uh, thank you very much. And on my last slide, and, and you'll all be able to see this, uh, there's just a few resources that you all have, have available. And so with that, I look forward to your questions and I'll pass it over to Randy. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, David, before you uh, click off real quick, your counts uh, on those just now, there were total populations of all races. Is that the- Correct, the, that's correct. correct. Those that's are all, all races, total population. Yep. Of course, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So hi everyone, uh, again, I'm Randy Aki. I'm uh, located on Tongva land here in Los Angeles, California. I'm originally from Hawaii and I'm a professor at UCLA and I've been working with NCAI and David uh, on this for boy, over a year now. Uh, and I'll show you some um, results that build on what David has just shown and, um, and show you how they're there are some changes, but not a lot. And so this data that uh, I'm showing you comes from IPPUMS, the NHGIS, which uh, David has um, you know, thoughtfully put together for all of us to use, free of use, uh, um, as uh, Cornell uh, has also put together um, uh, uh, similar data uh, at their sizer. Uh, and then there's also the US Census uh, provides the 2010 demonstration data on their website. So th that's where the sources come from. Next slide, please. So I'll show you some results from the demonstration data, both the one from last year as well as from this year. Uh, and then we'll look at specific uh, uh, differences for tribal areas in California, villages in Alaska, and just a couple of maps. Next slide, please. So the way to look at this figure is uh, each of those dots represent um, AIAN uh, reservation, so not a village, uh, tribal village. Uh, in Alaska. And across the bottom, uh, we have the AIAN alone population. So this differs uh, from what David was showing because he had total population. So you might have non-natives, non-Indians uh, located on a reservation, living on a reservation as well. Here, what I've done is just chosen American Indian Alaska Native alone uh, in from the 2010 census. And each of those black dots uh, would be the population. And there's a big outlier on the far right, which as David was talked about earlier, is the Navajo Nation, of course, which is a really large population. And then on the y-axis, uh, we have the uh, 
the 2010 census data with differential privacy enacted. And uh, so that's sort of what the data would look like if we have a differential privacy uh, you know, applied here. And so the way that it looks is the red line means that you, know, you have exact correspondence between the actual data and uh, the differentially private. The problem is that um, a lot of things are happening below the 50,000, actually below the 10,000 uh, population, because that's where most um, American Indian tribal reservations lie in terms of size, in terms of populations in, of American Indians. Uh, and so uh, this slide, you know, sort of zoomed out, doesn't show us very much. Actually, it looks like things are pretty accurate. So now we'll zoom in a little bit. Next slide, please. So now we've uh, excluded populations, reservations with more than 30,000 people of American Indian, Alaskan Native ancestry. You start to see a little bit more of sort of the individual tribal uh, observations. And, you know, again, it's a little hard to discern, uh, but it looks like they're sl slightly below the red line, meaning there's an undercount. Next slide, please. So now we've zoomed into just reservations. If you look across the X axis of 10,000 people or less, uh, and there you can kind of, um, I think the picture is much more clear that uh, on average, there are more black dots or observations. And each of those observations, again, is a tribal uh, a reservation, uh, is below the red line, meaning that the actual 2010 census count uh, with differential privacy uh, is lower than what the actual 2010 census reported uh, in 2010. Uh, and so this is using the, uh, the demonstration data that was provided in 2019. And now the next slide shows the same analysis uh, for less than 10,000 people using the data that was provided this year, as David was talking about. And so the reason to show those two slides is that uh, the, the additional sort of um, allocation uh, to to uh, total population and emphasis uh, doesn't seem to have uh, impacted positively the, the the series of undercounts that are going on. So again, there was the version that we saw last year of, of de demonstration data and the version we see this year uh, in both cases for the AIA and alone uh, population, it appears that there's still this undercounting uh, going on uh, or underrepresentation in with differential privacy. Next slide, please. So now let's zoom down to just 5,000 uh, reservations with 5,000 or less American Indians. Uh, this again is using the data from 2019. And again, you can see there, I think a little bit more emphatically that uh, especially in the very small population uh, uh, reservations, again, probably rancherias in California, uh, there's, a, there's significant undercounting. Uh, and then if we look at the 2020 data, next slide, we see that not much has changed as well. Again, we get significant undercounting. So the takeaway from this is that <clears throat> with regard to a race subgroup uh, between last year and this year's implementation of differential privacy, the algorithm used uh, uh, for, for the population that we're talking about, American Indian alone on reservation, uh, it doesn't seem as if there's been a change uh, with regard to the, or, or a remedy to the issue of undercounting. Next slide, please. And I'll show you another piece of information. Uh, another way we often count people on reservations are not just American Indians alone, but we also count American Indian in combination. Uh, so that's a wider group of, of individuals. It's individuals who have other races. Uh, and what I wanna emphasize here, so this is using the 2019 data, again, for reservations with uh, less than 10,000 people. And we see that the same result happens. So it isn't just an artifact of using American Indian alone that race group alone. It also uh, comes about when we look at American Indian in combination with other race groups. So we still get a consistent undercount, unfortunately, uh, using even a broader uh, definition of race uh, in this situation. Okay, next slide, please. So we'll go on to California, just to show you a couple of examples, next. So again, this is uh, California and many uh, reservations in California are very small. And here you can see that almost all except for, you know, one, two, maybe three of the rancherias are below uh, their, their, their 2010 actual amounts, right? They're all below the red uh, 45 degree line. Next slide, please. 
Here's another way of looking at that same amount. It's just on the left side, the y-axis is just a count of how many individuals are missing, what David was talking about earlier. Uh, so there's a system, systematic undercounting. So, you know, if you look at about 500, uh, you know, these pop, some of these rancherias that have about 500 people, uh, if you look on the left, a number of those are missing, you know, anywhere between uh, 100 and 200 people, right? So anywhere from 20 to, to 40 percent of the population uh, is just missing. Uh, and again, it's systematic in this sense that, uh, you know, there's only a few that are sort of got have an overcount. And, and to be clear, it's not also... Um, it's not also, also necessarily true that having an overcount or an overestimation of your population is going to be a better either, because again, it may give you false sense of, of, of the, the size and the kind of resources that have to be allocated. So again, uh, we tend to see an undercount here, but it's not also, it's not also symmetrically useful that an overcount is necessarily beneficial for, for planning purposes for allocations of funds either. Okay, next slide, please. So let's look at Alaska. Next slide. So this is for Alaska Native villages. So here, uh, again, we are looking at populations, uh, tribal villages that are uh, excluding everyone, very large ones, uh, so a thousand people or less. And again, you see that there's, uh, on average, most of the observations tend to be below the 45 degree line, uh, although there are some that are above it. Uh, next slide. And this is using the 2020s uh, differential private uh, demonstration data. So again, uh, you know, there's a little bit more above, so there's a little bit more symmetry, uh, but still a huge amount of observations uh, that are being undercounted. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is the same uh, situation that I showed for California. So again, in some villages that have 400 people, for instance, you see there's you know 150 people mi missing, right? So huge amounts potentially in in some uh, of these communities. On the other hand, if you look at 200 and you go straight up, uh, there's a village there that uh, may have almost 100 extra people, you know, counted in this case, right? So a doubling. Or, or, I mean, sorry, a 50% increase uh, of the population, right, overnight, essentially, uh, you know, over the course of a decade. But that, those are huge, huge changes. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, one more, and so I'll just show you a map of Arizona, next. Uh, and then this just uh, talks about some of the stuff that uh, David was looking at uh, in terms of percentage change. Uh, here you can see Arizona, you can see the Navajo Reservation, Hopi. Uh, Hopi actually has a slight overcount uh, in terms of percent. Uh, so it's somewhere between the zero to 10% overcount, but all these other reservations uh, have, you know, somewhere between a zero and negative 50% undercount. Uh, and then that reservation, that, up in the top left uh, has somewhere between negative 50 to negative 100% uh, undercount. Uh, so again, just graphically showing you how these uh, the percent changes can differ even in, within the same state, for instance. Next slide. Uh, and this is for Washington state. Again, wide variation across the reservations in that state. Okay, next slide. Uh, one more. This is my end. So again, I think it's, you know, I think I'm just advocating whatever others have been advocating here. You know, tribal governments need to sort of understand privacy laws and they must be engaged in this this uh, this discussion. Uh, and, you know, I think we've answered one of these questions here. Actually, now that I think about it, we know what happens to the missing population. Uh, uh, it just gets lost. Uh, and so, yes, and I still think that, you know, an allocation to the AIA and NH population in terms of geography is going to be really important uh, in, in pursuing this. And with that, I'll stop and open for questions. Great. Well, thank you, David and Randy, for your presentation. I know it is complicated statistically, but I really appreciate you helping us understand that if the U.S. Census Bureau applies these privacy protections, which they are planning to do, we have the potential of many smaller uh, rural or remote tribes might end up with lower counts than they actually have. And that could be devastating for lots of reasons. Um, for federal funding formulas, they may not get the funding they need. Um, it could be that uh, they might not be as represented 
in voting. Um, it may be that, um, you know, they, the data that we normally rely on may not be as good. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to look at the data that the Census Bureau has released and to sort of give us examples of how we lose those counts when the privacy methods are applied. Uh, so I appreciate you guys helping with that. And so now we're going to take some time to answer some of the questions that have been submitted on the questions pane. So I will ask those to you and David um, and Randy, you can um, choose to answer them or not choose to answer them depending on your talk. So the, um, the first question is, um, you talked about that this privacy method is uh, a statistical method, but there are some policy decisions and choices that have to be made by the U.S. Census Bureau. Can you explain who's going to make those decisions and maybe even when they're going to make those decisions that will obviously impact termination? Sure. Um, the group that will make the decision is the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee at the U.S. Census Bureau. This is made up of um, the senior executive staff, the director, the deputy director, as well as the heads of the various uh, divisions of the Census Bureau, the decennial division, the American Community Survey Division. And they, uh, they will be the ones making the ultimate decision about the privacy loss budget and the allocation of the privacy loss budget to uh, geographies and variables. And they're, they're taking feedback from their internal staff at census as well as uh, groups um, uh, I'm on a National Academy of Sciences panel that's looking into this uh, Randy and I both presented at a National Academies conference in in December taking feedback from all of these groups taking feedback from state uh, governmental organizations local planning agencies uh, looking into um, what are the legal uses of the data what matters the most so they can make that decision um, the the timeline for that decision is in a little bit of flux right now, given all the changes to the Bureau's operational plans. Uh, in May, uh, the timeline looked as if the, uh, the final um, decision about the algorithm, so exactly what the computer code would be that would be run on the data, had to be set by October of this year. And then the final decision on the privacy loss budget and its allocation would be made uh, in January or early February of 2021 um, so that they could then create the, the data sets that will be published in, in March. Um, for a while, uh, when the Census Bureau was talking about delaying the, the count due to or delaying the, the completion of the count due to COVID, those, those decisions have been pushed back uh, two or three months so that the computer code would be finalized by December and the final uh, privacy loss budget parameters would be set in April. Um, but as of today, with the stopping of the count in, uh, in on the end of September and the decision to uh, release the apportionment counts by the end of December, all of a sudden those, those October and um, February deadlines are, are still in play. Uh, there's still time for groups to give their feedback. So the tribal consultations that are coming up will be excellent ways for tribal uh, representatives to uh, make their opinions known to the Census Bureau about what's most important to the tribal nations of, uh, of the US. Um, and um, researchers like Randy and I can still get our feedback in, but that's the general timeline and the people making the decision. All right, thank you. Um, so there's definitely more time to give input, but um, I really appreciate the point you make that if we can get the counts up, the census response rates up, that will help mitigate some of the impact of these statistical ways of protecting privacy. And we just started publishing some response rates on our website um, to help tribal um, land, nations know the response rates and how far they have to go to meet the 2010 rate or the national rate but we all are trying to get to 100 percent unfortunately mm -hmm. we have to do that by september 30th which is you know really complicated thing all right let's see the next 
question. Um, will these pluses and minuses in the count be represented in the final data? That is, will people know whether their data is inaccurate or not? Uh, so we don't know yet. So technically, the Bureau could publish uh, an error bar around their count. They could tell you that the count is 500 plus or minus some value. Um, but as of today, that is not that the Bureau is will not be doing that unless they make a change in their policy. Uh, so we won't have a good sense of how inaccurate the, the those counts uh, are. It's going to be really important for us to compare the 2010, the 2020 data to the 2010 summary file one counts when that's released, because what we'll be able to do is to tell whether or not we've seen an increase or decrease in the counts for particular tribal areas, and then using local knowledge, using knowledge about what's gone on over the last 10 years, uh, local groups should be able to tell whether or not that count is um, you know, potentially off because of because of the of the error uh, injection. Yeah, and and for sure the the actual amount that's added to each cell is not going to be allowed because that just undoes the uh, census algorithm that's in the first mm -hmm. place. So as David was saying, all numbers in the final versions will be presented with this fuzziness around it. So as David was saying, it'll be plus or minus some amount, <clears throat> but it will never, uh, because again, that will defeat the purpose of the, the um, differential privacy uh, algorithm, which is to obscure uh, the, the, act, the true count, because otherwise then that gets used to identify individuals uh, in other ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think um, I think you're right, David. I think you know, in the ultimately, it'll it'll take right the comparison of the uh, of what people know, what's happened with regard to migration, in migration, mm -hmm. out migration, but also you know, sort of standard demographic, uh, you know, sort of adjustment for birth rates and those kinds of things, uh, and then and then once those things have been as um, accommodated as much as possible, then are there still discrepancies that are wide? Mm -hmm. uh, and those will be the, the ones that will be really, um, you know, of concern and of, of interest, of course. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, one other question was, if, um, if the people and not the computer are setting the error amount, couldn't these be made smaller or none at all? For our population? So technically, yes. The, the, the committee could decide that they want to make those curves, like I showed, very, very narrow. So they could make those curves in such a way that the noise injection was quite small for any particular um, uh, variable or for any particular geographic area. And that still has a possibility of happening. Um, they um, they probably couldn't set it to to no error. I don't, there's no way to get a zero at noise injection, but they could set that value so that it was very um, uh, very small noise injection. Um, but that is going to be a um, an internal debate. They're going to deb you know there's going to be people on that committee who are going to want more privacy, so they're going to want larger noise injection. There's going to be people on that committee who want more accuracy and the question is going to be how uh, how that how they come to a come to consensus or how they uh, how they make those decisions uh, at the bureau there's a lot of internal now, we, there's, there's a lot of internal even within the census bureau there is people who have very strong opinions about privacy versus accuracy so this is this is there's not just a uniform opinion even even within the bureau Now we've heard that they, because we've been pushing really hard in tribal consultation, that they need to make sure that our data is accurate for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Do you have ideas about how that could happen or what we could recommend that the U.S. Census Bureau do to help our data be more accurate? Uh, in terms of in terms of the counts, uh, in terms of this process, 
I mean, I think, I mean, I think the allocation towards uh, tribal geographies, AIA and NH geographies, uh, some of that privacy loss budget would go a long distance. Uh, and then I think the the other issue, which everyone is working towards anyway, is as you know, getting at the count that right without fail will be uh, the best possible uh, outcome. Um, so pushing on both of those prongs, I think are going to be important. Another possibility would be to create, uh, and I don't know if this is, I, I don't know if the Bureau would even consider this, but they can create an, an AIANH data file that was produced independently of the rest of the decennial 2020 products. And that individual product could have a particular privacy loss budget allocated towards it, and, and it could be made more accurate. The drawback to producing a separate file for AIA and HH areas is that the, the counts from that will not be consistent with the counts from other, uh, other um, products. So you could have a state, so uh, let's say there's a state funding formula, a funding formula where data are allocated to states based on the AIAN alone count within that state. The, the count for that from the say summary file one equivalent and the count of AIA and alone from the AIA and H area data file will not be the same. One of them will be bigger or smaller. And so that inconsistency could be problematic, but I would think that an AIA and HH alone data set would be more accurate, um, but there would be trade-offs to, to something like that. Another question is, um, why is the impact of these new privacy methods so great on American Indians and Alaska Natives? And are there other populations that are similarly affected? And um, if Randy could let us know about the Native Hawaiian population as well. Hi. Uh, so my understanding is that, yeah, it definitely is. Uh, again, the smaller the population, the more adverse the impact. Uh, and so some of the smaller race uh, subgroups, uh, for instance, within Asian, uh, it's potentially problematic there as well. Um, for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, definitely an issue as well. Uh, there were some, we had some presenters in um, December showing that in a couple of places in Arizona, well, one place in Arizona, that the population Native Hawaiian was like 80%, uh, you know, and which is a huge error from what it was in the 2010 census. So just huge, unusual outliers. Um, so yeah, other groups also fare poorly. Uh, potentially fare poorly as well. And it depends on the, the geographic unit being used ultimately. The issue with, again, the native peoples is that there is very little allocation. Well, there's no allocation of the privacy loss budget. Um, but nevertheless, it doesn't mean that some of these other groups aren't also affected. Um, but, but that's one of the primary reasons, I think. The, the, just to follow up on that, the, the, what happens in the in the tribal areas is that with, on tribal areas, the AIAN alone population is the is the majority. It's the largest kind of population group on those. And what happens in differential privacy is that those large groups tend to end up getting pulled downward by the algorithm. So um, because AIAN areas are just predominantly Alaska, uh, Alaska Native or American Indians, the AIAN counts get pulled down. So you get that consistent undercount that Randy had talked about. In, in other areas, you, if you had a, say, a, a, a city that was 80% Hispanic and you applied differential privacy to that, you could see that Hispanic count getting pulled downward a little bit as the other uh, non-Hispanic groups were, were pushed upwards. Um, I think AIA and tribal areas are, are really like um, one of the few geographic units that really is predominantly um, populated by people who identify uh, as a single single uh, race group. Okay, thank you. Um, we also um, 
heard last year that because of the application of these new privacy methods, they may not be able to produce the American Indian Alaska Native summary file that we're used to seeing in the group two product that a lot of tribes go to to get um, data on their, their tribe and the characteristics of the people in the tribe. Um, can you explain why that might be difficult to reconstruct if they apply those privacy methods? My, my takeaway are that is that the uh, a lot of the a lot of the tribes that people um, belong to are, are just they're not that lot they're not, they tend to not be very large right there's a lot of tribes there's not they're not that large of a population size and so your that noise injection is just gonna swamp that that error value is gonna kind of just be much bigger or smaller than the true count of that of that tribe um, and that uh, really publishing that data set wouldn't even be useful for tribal members because you just wouldn't know what the count of that of that tribe was. So um, what would tribes do if they wanted to know what their census counts were and they were one of the smaller tribes, like less than a thousand population? Uh, so this is this is tricky, right? Because tr AIAN, as kind of a, as as a as a race category, gets an allocation of the privacy loss budget because of race gets a allocation. Uh, individual tribes um, would would not get a specific allocation. What what groups would what what I would advocate for would be a product that was tribe specific and that had a separate privacy loss budget that was, was was subdivided or allocated to tribes. And that was kind of a separate product that could be published uh, because those small, small tribes, um, uh, uh, and I'm thinking here, I live in Minnesota, the, Sh the Sh uh, Shakopee Mindewanakan tribe is, is quite prominent here in the Twin Cities, but it's not very big. It's only a couple of hundred individuals, I believe. And um, um, I don't know what their their counts might look quite inaccurate unless they have unless the bureau produced a special tribal specific uh, uh, data product. Okay, thank you. And um, another question is, so it seems like it's a balance between privacy versus accuracy. Um, does it have to be a trade-off? I think the answer is yes. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's what's being advocated that ultimately the, there's, you have to obscure, you have to hide some of the data uh, in order to get uh, protection. Um, and so that's the, that's the foundation we're, we're, we're sort of living in. Um, there's been some analysis though, and maybe David knows some of it, uh, that some of the, uh, the re-identification, which is the, the risk aspect of, of finding individuals, individual people using the census data, uh, is not as high as some, some people had initially, um, anticipated. So that, that maybe the, uh, the, the fundamental, fundamental, uh, motivation here is not as severe or as dire as originally, uh, discussed. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, some of us are still trying to make sense of this, uh, right? What's the, there's a trade-off there's uh, so right in the perfect world. Yes. Right. The, 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 and I think the, the most extreme version is none of the data gets released <laughs> except for, you know, the total population count, which is 380 million people, maybe, uh, or I don't know. And that's it. You get nothing more. And then for sure, everybody's data is secure. You can't find me. You can't find David. You can't find Yvette. Uh, you know, through multiple uh, imputation and, and, and data set collection, uh, you know, linkages. On the other hand, the data is completely transparent, uh, where all of it is, you know, released, uh, and then we have no privacy. And again, different countries handle that differently. And that is something that David has been, you know, uh, stressing here is that 
these are all policy decisions and uh, they are, you know, they are set by Congress and then interpreted by the agencies uh, and so are enacted by the agencies, I should say. And, um, and so that ultimately comes down to what we think is the agreeable trade-off. Uh, but before that, I guess the step before that is we have to be able to accurately identify and assess the, the, the true harm or the, 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 the problem. As it stands, uh, yeah. The, the other thing that I was I wanted to uh, piggyback on Randy's thoughts were there were that in some respects it's a philosophical discussion, right? You, if you philosophically have to decide, is my privacy worth, you know, what's my privacy worth re related to the data, and and you know, I think this is an understudied aspect. You know, for example, you we could do surveys of particular subpopulations like AIAN identifying people hispanics you could do surveys and figure out wh what is that trade-off you're willing to make to, to kind of figure out how much uh, willingness different groups have towards protecting their privacy versus getting accurate data and that's something that's just never been done especially on a large scale and so really the bureau doesn't have a lot of I mean, the, the people pushing differential privacy have not really done those types of studies. And so there's nothing really to, you know, fundamentally uh, provide the Bureau with that, with that trade-off and, and how, how much people are willing to, to risk. I mean, for me personally, as a, as a you know, as a non-Hispanic white man, male, you know, my privacy is to me, I live in a privileged life that it's not as big a deal to me as it might be to someone else who lives in a community who's the only person who identifies as American Indian um, alone in a particular area. And, and for them, it's a very different different life, but we need to kind of do the research to figure out how much that, how much that matters. And that really hasn't been done yet. Good question. Great, thank you. Well, I see we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank you guys so much um, for coming and talking to us and trying to take a really complicated topic and, you know, try to explain it in a way that um, everybody can understand. And I think what's really clear is we could have a lot of undercounts. We could have some undercounting of tribal nations, especially the smaller ones, based on this, these privacy methods but that there's policy decisions to be made. And so that's where tribal consultation and tribal nations could really, you know, make their preferences known on this issue of accuracy versus privacy and some more specific recommendations if they can have those. Um, I'll give you a chance to, any last minutes of advice for us in Indian country on what we should do, given this horrible choice between privacy and accuracy and, the decisions for this being policy decisions happening soon. Any advice? I, I think knowing, um, having a good handle on what the data get used for by local, local tribal groups, you know, for schools or other federal programs, you know, really having a good sense of how, how these data get allocated, how the funds get allocated, how representation matters, like just having, really knowing about that and then being able to advocate for um, how important those are to tribal communities uh, and, and individual tribes is going to be really important and and then get the get the count out and get that response rate as high as possible so that the differentially private noise will have less of an impact. I agree 100 percent. That's exactly what I would say. Great. Well, our civic engagement team at NCAI will be very happy to hear that the focus right now has to include getting the highest counts necessary. Yeah. So anyway, I would like to thank our speakers for their great presentations today. They're very busy people. They're very much in demand because of the knowledge they have. So thank you for taking the time today. We'd also like to thank all of our attendees for joining. Um, don't forget to complete the feedback survey form that you will receive in the follow-up email after this webinar. And this webinar will be available as a recording soon on our YouTube channel that you can access from our website. Uh, and please, once you see that link, feel free to send it to your colleagues who may be interested. And if you have any further questions on this topic, you can contact the speakers or our NCAI staffer, Gwen Evans-Lomayezva. She's a researcher with the NCAI Policy Research Center 
She's on the committee with David Van Riper They're at the National Academy of Science and Engineering, where they're getting uh, really um, updated information that we're not all getting. And so you're welcome to contact Gwen if you have further questions. And I have just one announcement before we leave today. Make sure to register to attend the 15th Annual Tribal Leader Scholar Forum. This year is a virtual meeting and it's happening next week on September 1st through 3rd, and it's only half days. So we have three half days planned of a great agenda on policy research and data relevant to tribal nations, and we will cover this topic as well. You can find the registration information and an agenda on our website or links in our social media. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Goodbye.